Hi, everyone. How are you? Woo, yeah, woo, woo for you. Thank, <laughs> thank you all so much for being here tonight. Uh, my name is Rebecca Stummy. I'm the producer for live events here at LAS, and I'm so thrilled to see all of you here. Um, thank you so much for coming. Thanks. Um, all right, let's do some polls now. Who is here for the first time at the Crawford? Oh, nice, welcome. Thank you all so much for coming. And who listens to us at 89.3 LAS? Oh yes, fantastic. Um, and who reads our stories at las.com? Great. Anyone listen to our podcast from LAS Studios? Fantastic. I wanna encourage you to check out the Barbie tapes. It is fascinating. It's only three episodes. It's a really fast, fun listen. So please check that out from LAS Studios. Um, all right, so uh, we have a great conversation tonight. It's almost the 50th anniversary of hip hop, which I'm sure you all know. So we're gonna, yes, 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 clap it up. Um, if you have questions tonight during the discussion, you can go to slido.com and use the hashtag on point. Tony's going to put that up for you. There you go. Um, at any point during the event tonight, if you have any questions and we'll make sure that they get to the folks on stage, those folks are going to be Tyree Boyd Pates. He is a speaker, curator, historian, all the great things. He's currently the associate curator of Western history at the Autry Museum of the American West. And we are thrilled to have him here tonight. We also have Demita Jo Freeman. She is a soul train dancer, a pioneer, yes, a pioneer in hip hop dance here in Los Angeles. She continues that work uh, now and we are just honored to have her here. And your host for tonight is Meghna Chakrabarty from On Point. Yes, we are so excited for the discussion tonight. So please welcome them all to the stage. Thank you, Becca. Thank you so much. Thank you to the LAist. Um, this is the second time I've come down here and we're planning on doing something every summer, right? Yay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm, I'm Magna. I host on point and I love being on in LA. This is the most, this is the most incredible audience. Don't tell my Bostonian folks that I said that, <laughs> uh, because you guys are engaged, you're intelligent. And I, I think I said this last year, but I absolutely know when the show has aired on the LAist because like five minutes later, we get a lot of phone calls and messages <laughs> and feedback and stories. So it's, it's great, it's wonderful. So thank you all for being here tonight. Um, let me just turn on the old iPad so I can get this going. Uh, and I'll give you, oh, I just put my home iPad, but there we go. <laughs> so when, when Becca said, hey, when you, when you come down this summer, what do you wanna do? I was like, I don't know, there's so much to talk about that's relevant to, um, to Southern California and greater Los Angeles. She's just like, you know, let's, it's gonna be the 50th anniversary of hip hop. So should we have a conversation about West Coast uh, hip hop? And I was like, that, <laughs> I wanna do that. And we have the most incredible people here to talk about this with us tonight. <laughs> Um, we will run out of time, trust me, <laughs> and you will want to know more. Uh, as, as Becca said, this is Tyree Boyd Pates. Give him a round of applause. <laughs> and of course, Demita Jo Freeman, the legendary. <laughs> All right, before I let things go too long. There is a clock up there. Good. Um, so this is, I mean, I guess we could say officially we're coming up on the 50th anniversary of hip hop, even though I would say that its roots go back further than that, which we'll talk about um, a little bit later. But I wanted to start with a quick take from both of you on how you would describe hip hop's impact on the world, okay? Yeah, I'm going to start with you, Tyree. Oh, ladies first. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Demetri, oh, got to hold up the mic. Michael. Yeah, there you go. I am a lady. Thank you very much. <laughs> but anyway, hip hop to me, when I first started, it was in the 70s. 
to hear and to see hip hop change. And the dancers, these are young kids. They were doing our kind of dancing and adding more dancing. And it changed the world really yeah. to me. It's because it's their dancers in China, in Japan, in London. I mean, I see it on TikTok or <laughs> Google, or they would send some tapes to me, but it was in fact amazing to see. I don't know if anybody feels that to see your own kids, they are you. Mm -hmm. And so therefore that feeling, that's my kid. My kid is the dance. And then hip hop, when it came into life, I just went, oh my God, that's all I can say. Yeah. yeah. Uh, when I think about hip hop's impact on the world, I, I think about how you could literally just put revolution in one person's body mm. and have them move so contagiously that the world wants to know how they did that. Yeah. Yes. And to know that like hip hop started in the streets, mm -hmm. in the Bronx, but had impact. <laughs> okay, Bronx. <laughs> <laughs> um, from the Bronx all the way to have an impact on Los Angeles and then spread like the best cold you could ever catch. <laughs> um, I, I, clearly I caught it. No, um, <laughs> but it, it, it's, it's something that reminds me as a historian that we're living in the history right now. That's mm -hmm. right. And to watch a black musical genre take over the world is, it's makes amazing. my, gives me goosebumps. Yes. <laughs> well, you know, so Demita just said about how, you know, seeing your kids, seeing you, seeing yes. your story on stage, hearing it in the music, how powerful mm -hmm. that is and was. So uh, picking up on that thought, mm -hmm. Tyree, I just want to uh, quickly hear from you. Um, when you were growing up, sort of, I, I know there's probably not one experience where you're like, now I know what hip hop is, <laughs> but, but like, tell me a little bit about how you experienced it and what it meant to you um, as a young boy. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm I'm from LA, born and raised. I feel like I'm the last person who can say <laughs> that. Uh, but but like shout out to the Angelinos who are listening and watching and, and stuff like that. But I grew up as a black kid in Koreatown. Mm -hmm. And like being a black kid in Koreatown in the 90s, directly after the LA riots, was definitely a time. <laughs> and the beauty of it was that what was innovating in South Central, particularly when it comes to music was spreading to K-Town mm. and I saw br black, brown and Asian people taking a hold of the genre and making it their own in Koreatown. And so like, when you gotta give like, cause I had to do my research, like there's the invisible scratch pickles that are LA based. You have the immortal fader fighters. You have all of these people, um, our Asian brothers and sisters who in K-Town and, and surrounding areas we're able to innovate a genre, but also give homage to how yeah. black and beautiful it was. Mm -hmm. I love that. And that's what makes me me. And so I touched a turntable in Griffith Park at a at like a, a barbecue. And it was DJ Kidwick who like showed me the turntable, but my uncle used to play Tribe Called Quest yeah. over and over <laughs> and over again in our bedroom where we lived together. And that like it's stuck in my DNA ever since. Yeah. And I fell in love with hip hop, just like Common did. And um, she hasn't broken up with me yet. <laughs> no, so, yeah. Neither have I her. So, that's, that's my quickest story. <laughs> um, so, so then Demita, same question to you because you are one of the pioneers mm -hmm. in helping um, popularize at, uh, hip hop as, as a way of life, as yes. a culture. Um, you know, for, to the black community and beyond, right? Correct. Oh, by the way, okay, I have to just tell you, I was telling Demita this earlier. So I hadn't seen a ton of Soul Train <laughs> growing up. That's my, that's my oversight, and right. I, forgive me for that. But I was watching a bunch of videos of her dancing, and there was one that I just watched over and over <laughs> and over again, because A, she's like, you're like a comet lighting up the stage, and B, the man standing behind her is James Brown, <laughs> okay? And get this, the godfather of soul, 
standing behind Demita Joe. <laughs> And he's looking her, looking at her up and down. You can Google this. You'll find it in a second. <laughs> looking at her up and down, and he looks like he's like, I do not know what to do. <laughs> I will not be able to keep up with her, right? I mean, that's right. That, that's that's what he was. He looked like he didn't know what to do. He didn't, and I didn't know what I was doing either <laughs> because I never heard that song before. This was the very first time that everybody, the world, was going to hear "Super Bad." <laughs> And so when I went up on the uh, stairs, when he, uh, when we started, it was like, okay, keep going. <laughs> he loves to play that beat. Okay, keep going. So in my head, I'm looking, I'm smiling. <laughs> I have no idea what's coming out of his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and when his mouth came and when the, you could feel the music when it drops or when it changes up. So therefore I said, oh, change. <laughs> and I start dancing and I'm just, kept going and his smile and the guys who were looking, they just kept looking. And I said, oh Lord, I'm in trouble. I'm doing something. I don't know what I'm doing. But I just uh, uh, threw in the robot and I threw in so many different things. I mean, it's a it's a work of art that yeah. you're doing there. I'm telling you. Well, you know, here and here's the power of it because it, it relates to what you were saying. Even all these years later, mm -hmm. watching that little clip of that episode of the show, as a viewer, you you feel it. You still feel it yes. in your own bodies. That's what you were able to do across decades. Yes. Now, um, you've said before that um, it's locking yes. that started. This it. started the whole yeah. thing. So, for folks who um, who don't know or or aren't totally familiar with yes. locking as a, as a dance style. Can you describe it? Okay. And, and also why you think it was really critical to the development of hip hop? Well, the first time I started to see it, I went to a club in LA that was called Mavericks Flat. That was where all the young kids used to hang out and go to. And there was this guy that walked in, his name was Don Campbell, mm -hmm. which he calls himself Campbell Lock. And then there was another guy called Scooby-Doo. And then there was another guy that calls Little Joe. And then the last guy was Little P Perry, Perry Brown. And so anyway, I just watched him because I was what you call a wallflower. Nobody wanted to dance with me. So therefore, I'm just always looking and I'm noticing the ladies that dance with them. They back up, you know let them have the room and they started to have the whole stage and they are locking bam bam boom, bop, boom, la, da, da, da. i mean they are going and my all i could do is <laughs> my god what did they do i just love the guy named campbell lock the way he was doing it, the ease of it and he was a person that doesn't dance either he didn't know about the rhythm he was a wallflower himself he made everything all up all that staccato start happening and so i just looked at him because i'm a dancer of course a ballerina but i just had lived everything he was doing when he asked me to dance and i just started doing this and he was shocked and i was shocked <laughs> <laughs> and so bam people start loving what we're doing because girls at that time, they were not dancing like the guys because the yeah. guys with the old macho guys moving and the girls were just cute, you know, cool. That was, you know, the Afro <laughs> and the, and the, and the mini skirts and the, and the hot pants and everything was cute. You know, me, I didn't care. I just wanted to come and dance. <laughs> so therefore, watching him and then we got a chance to go on a show called soul train mm -hmm. and then when we went on soul train i'm looking at the other kids how they are mimicking they're picking up what we're doing and don was very upset in the beginning he was saying that guy's trying to dance like me and i said don't worry about it that is the ultimate he loves you yeah. i said you know what you're doing he doesn't so <laughs> therefore he started dancing I start dancing and this other guy did like the robot. And so I will follow him. We were sitting in a chair. Just keep moving. And so therefore I added, 
I'm a person that adds things because the guys were so macho mm. and I wanted to keep my femininity about dancing a little bit. So therefore I would kick my leg <laughs> and then Campbell would split. So it split, hi, split, hi. So therefore that was the beginning yeah. of Soul Train was the locking. Mm -hmm. And out of the locking came all these things like the robot. I mean, even when Michael Jackson was on, he was impressed <laughs> about he wanted to dance like the girl with the leg control. And I'm going like, who, me? Okay. But it was so interesting about Soul Train was that you get a chance to meet not only the dancers, but the artist mm -hmm. and also the music. Of course, it was uh, music we can dance by, but we start doing, if you listen to uh, Stevie Wonder and he did a, a song called um, uh, Sup Very Superstitious. So in the beginning of it, he used staccato. So therefore, we start dancing on every yeah. beat of the music. That's changing because everybody was dancing on coolness, uh -huh. dancing on the music. Uh -huh. We were dancing to the music. Uh -huh. So on yeah. everything. So things started changing. And so people, uh, when I say people, I mean the kids at that time, they were enjoying what we were doing. It was not only just dancing, but we were giving an entertainment. It's like uh, the Globetrotters. You remember the Globetrotters? Oh, yeah. They were fabulous basketball players. That's the very, very first time. They are the best, but they decided to have a group called the Globetrotters and it entertained kids. Mm -hmm. They were involved in how they are acting. They were uh, they, they would yeah. dribble, they would do so many different things, but bam, that's what's changed the basketball to make it show business like. Right. And, Dem Demita, do you mind if I just step in mm -hmm. a little bit? Because you said something that, um, that le leads me to another question that I wanted to ask about the whole world of hip hop, right? Yes. Because you, we just heard Demita say that with locking and um, how visual it was and, and it is, and how it was so tied into the beat. It was. Right? So it was the two art forms were, were um, you know, intrinsically reliant upon each other. Yes. And that made me think about how for a lot of folks, when they think about hip hop, the first thing that might come to mind is the music, but there's an entire culture, culture. of hip hop. So could you describe Tyree sort mm -hmm. of the other aspects of hip hop? Of course, well? of course. So what Demita is alluding to is that there's five points of hip hop. Locking is under the b-boy, is b-boying. Yes. Uh, MCing, DJing, graffiti, and how many is that? Yeah. Yeah. There's four? four? That's four, okay. And then the last one, of course, KRS-One would kill me if I didn't say this. <laughs> is knowledge <laughs> and those five elements comprise of hip-hop culture mm -hmm. and the emphasis on knowledge is probably the most key because for black youth especially out of the 70s and the 80s when they're coming into their own after the civil rights movement and the uh the black power movement knowledge of self is the most critical aspect mm -hmm. to why you b-boy to why you rap to why you dj and to and, and to why you um uh, scratch as mm -hmm. well and these five elements are are what we're all doing unconsciously yes. <laughs> or taking part of especially when we're locking yes mm, okay <laughs> no it's I mean, deep y'all it's deep it, no well and that's exactly right right because it's not just you know a musical genre or just, right, it, right. It, it is um, someone asked me why a while ago why I was so excited to do this <laughs> this event tonight, and because and my my for, automatic first answer is that hip hop is the American story. Absolutely, yes, it right. Is. It, Absolutely. I would say it's one of the most Amer uh, important American stories of the, the of the twentieth century, Easily. right? Mm -hmm. Did, yeah, I, and and in part because of its it's both simultaneously um, of 
the the black community in right. America, but yeah. also open and inclusive to anyone who wants who to, to gain the knowledge, gain right? The knowledge. <laughs> um, and it's this time when everything was changing. Wow. Yeah. And dancing was changing, music was changing, wow. rappers were coming out of all, instead of being a poetry, uh, a same port, poem stuff, you would have rappers with a music mm -hmm. attached to it, mm -hmm. which you always did, mm -hmm. but now it is like standing in, in front of everybody. Yeah. Right. So it's all like it all happened at once. Yeah. You know, we're, yeah, we're, so obviously, again, this, this event is pegged to the 50th anniversary of hip hop, which is recognized as the anniversary date is coming out in New York, right? <laughs> um, by the way, I think someone told me that there's some folks, or maybe at least one kind of important person in this audience who's really serious about New York hip hop. He might also be uh, the head of the LAist. Is he? <laughs> 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 no, I don't want to make a thing out of this, but you know. East Coast, West Coast, <laughs> yes. which one is better? Uh -oh, yes, bro. Uh -oh. uh -oh. We ready to fight. Uh -oh. <laughs> I'll, I'll just let that lie here. Um, uh oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> we, we do a locking battle in the middle yes. of the room. Yes. <laughs> Put some breaking, right. some whacking. <laughs> but I keep raising the fact that, like, popularly we're acknowledging East Coast, mm -hmm. but um, as, as the date. But I, I was trying to think back about, you know, how could we define the beginning of mm. hip hop in the West Coast? Mm -hmm. And one thing came up, um, and Tyree, I want you to tell me what you think about this, mm. that really, uh, this is from a, a, another historian who said, the thing that helped give rise to hip hop in the West were the Watts riots in 1965, yeah. okay? Mm. Uh, and then, in because in 1967, a man named Bud, Bud Schulberg founded a creative space entitled the Watts Writers Workshop. Mm -hmm. And that was supposed to help folks from the neighborhood mm -hmm. have a place where they could express themselves. Mm -hmm. And, a, and a, at least a couple of groups emerged from that. Yes. So what, do you, what do you think about that? I mean, that's completely true. Um, you have the last, the last prophets who come out of Watts. Um, you have, uh, oh, see? <laughs> <laughs> Hold it down for me, I love it over there. <laughs> support me oh and also it's really beautiful because in in hip-hop rap music in particular the call and response we're a call and response culture so if you love us are you like what we say talk back to us this, yes. is, this is a part of the culture <laughs> hello hello you see you see that's how you do it that's how you do it holler 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 but but call and response is really important but the last prophets out of watts and that's why i started off my first statement with um this musical genre is birthed out of revolution yes, and it's also yes. birthed in the bodies of those who are dancing on soul train yes and we can't forget that because if there's a group of people who, who have been su historically suppressed and their actions have been limited mm -hmm. the best form of expression is creative it, expression that's true and so when you can't use your hands you use your mouth and we can't use your use mouth your you use your body. body and if you can't use your body you or if you want to use your body you put on special kinds of clothes to show your expression and your attitude. And that's the beauty of hip hop. And so out of Watts, The Last Prophets, but also the music, you have to give credit to funk music. Yeah, you gotta yes. give credit to Parliament Funkadelic and what they made because most of their records ended up getting sampled by Dr. Dre <laughs> and all of the other um, um, MCs and rappers because that's, that's who they grew up listening to. Right. And so true. there's revolution in who they're sampling. Mm -hmm. And now the generation after them are sampling the revolution that they sampled. And that's the beauty. And, and I think that's what makes West Coast hip hop so beautiful uh -huh. because how you how you wear the revolution i just love this word today uh, how you wear the revolution and how you listen to it um is actually very west coast as much as it is east mm -hmm. okay so tell me more than both of you um how would you describe the things that distinguish west coast hip-hop from from east coast what do you think well to me west coast hip-hopping in the beginning for me i'm a a, a locker yeah <laughs> but to see the how it changes into hip hop and see to me hip hop is really a name era you if you hear on tv they'll say oh this is the uh bandstand days the 60s were the rock and roll years or but now when they're saying 70s and on up that was the hip hop era mm -hmm. so the hip hop era was 
uh, it's like an umbrella. Mm -hmm. And under the umbrella is locking, is popping, mm -hmm. is uh, roboting, is breaking, is uh, whacking. Mm -hmm. It's so many elements. That to me is what hip hop is. It's all of the style of dancing that the young people today are doing. Yeah. And that they're making it today, they're making it so interesting. Uh, they take a piece of what we did and they create other things mm -hmm. toward it. Mm -hmm. That's to me, the hip hop. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. the creation mm -hmm. of ah, it. Okay. Yeah. And, and what makes it West Coast, I got to give a shout out to the World Class Wrecking Crew because that's what Dr. Yeah. Dre was <laughs> of course. a part of. And he, 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 <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, you you got to give a shout out to um, lowrider culture. That's right. That's that's distinctly West, West Coast, Coast hip hop. Yes. Um, what, am I missing something? Tell me, what do y'all think? What else makes something West Coast, if you don't mind? G-Funk. 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 Yes. Egyptian lover? Yes. Dickies. <laughs> Dickies, Converse, Cortez. What else? Hollywood. 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 That's right. Yeah, and Central Avenue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and hold on, hold on. Hey, and I would be remiss. Yeah. And I would be remiss because um, what makes LA's an epicenter for hip hop has to be mentioned about uh, Lamert Park. Mm -hmm. featuring Project Blowed yes. and the Freestyle Fellowship and all of those great <laughs> artists. That, that's, those are good things. Yes. <laughs> those are good things. That, that means we're hitting the notes. And, and Freestyle Fellowship and MERS and all of these rappers that came out from just, just miles down the street end up changing the face of a genre yeah. that, yes. that's world renowned. Yeah. The good life, the of good course. Life. The good life. So. Yes. <laughs> I got to be writing all these down. Yeah, um, write, it, write it down. <laughs> Chaos Network, all yes. of that. Well, in fact, mentioning all these names, and like we could go on and on and on, mm -hmm. right, um, is just one indication mm -hmm. of the impact mm -hmm. of artists and the art form of West Coast hip hop, how right. the impact that it's had well beyond, mm -hmm. you know, California and, and the West Coast. Mm -hmm. And I'm also wondering about not just its national and global impact, but I'd love to hear more from both of you about the impact that the rise, um, the spread, the development of hip hop music, dance and culture had um, on the very neighborhoods mm -hmm. here that were giving birth to it. Right. And the, and the reason why I ask is because, as I said earlier, I think it's one of the most important American stories. Yes. And it was the story, it is the story of the people, you know, yes. black Americans living in the, in the neighborhoods in Los Angeles. So I just want to hear more about how important that was. Yes. To the very people creating the art. Even to, for me, even um see i was a shy person dancing so it was to me hip-hop is a communication dancing was communication mm -hmm. so therefore by being accepted also helped that's part of hip-hop because young kids want to be accepted by anybody so but anyway when i was dancing my dancing started to develop as we're going on on Soul Train, it's getting bigger. Mm. It's getting more. Uh, artists were paying attention to us. We're just kids off the street. I mean, uh, my aunt has a, a party down at her basement. I mean, you want to know about my background? So dancing was a great form of even communicating to showbiz because we were never given that opportunity. So hip hop also, it's it's so big, it just started growing mm. and it's letting us in mm. to things that we never thought that, you know, just dancing in a nightclub and it's all dark and everything. <laughs> but now you're on a TV show, which there wasn't any black there was American Bandstand, that's four black people on the show. 
uh, uh, Shindy, you know, come on, there's two holy, you know, chocolate women just moving. <laughs> so, but no, Soul Train was a group of people, young kids who wanted to actually shout out, yeah. I'm alive, yeah. I'm here, look at me, I can be a part of this world. And so therefore, you know, being a black person, uh, now how men used to walk down the street, okay, women would grab their uh, uh, purses, they're mm -hmm. scared of them. Now we get a chance to show that we're not that, no, those those kind of people. No, we are people who love to dance, but we don't know how to get in. But you open up the door, hip hop uh, opened it up because it wasn't just dance, it was everything. Yeah. yeah. Uh, th speaking about the regional elements of hip hop, particularly the neighborhoods, you gotta give a shout out to Compton itself. Totally. Yes. Um, yeah. And yes. shout out to Compton. Uh, and. And, and Compton's really important for this example because what Kendrick Lamar has been able to symbolize mm -hmm. to Compton mm -hmm. as a Pulitzer Prize winning mm -hmm. uh, artist mm -hmm. is something that has to be mentioned for Compton. And that's nobody in Compton ever thought they would bring a Pulitzer back to Compton, right? But that's how important Compton is to this conversation. Mm -hmm. And I was listening to some interviews um, talk from Ice T, and he was he was alluding to how gangster rap out of the 1990s. So you think of the Chronic, you think you think Ice T, you think um, N.W.A. What what hip hop was in the 90s, specifically for South Central, was just journalism. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. It was actually yeah, okay, yeah, and <laughs> um, and it was journalism for not just for journalism's sake. But it was taking the microphone and showing the world, world how much you were ignoring Black America. Mm -hmm. And if you ignore us, then we're going to show you some attitude. <laughs> Period. Yeah. So hip hop really gave us a name. And, and so, and to know, to know um, that South Central has a stamp on that conversation journalistically, mm -hmm. yeah. I think is really important because it, just as much as it, how important the message was, to uh, New York City when it came out in the um, back in the heyday, like um, you know, straight out of Compton was the new message for the 1990s, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and and I and I and the world hasn't recovered since. And then don't even get me started about Snoop Dogg and what he's done for <laughs> Long Beach. <laughs> and he put and he arguably is one of the people who's put Long Beach on the map. Mm -hmm. He will tell you this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was so attractive it's so attractive that Tupac Shakur himself yes. when he joined Death Row was was banging the West Coast more than people who actually were born here <laughs> um, in the sense that Tupac became um, um, was rep representing um, LA in particular yeah. because mm -hmm. of the journalistic elements that his um, the pioneers were making too. I mm -hmm. think that is absolutely the perfect way of putting it, right? Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. it was the authentic first person journalism That's right. of lives and stories that the rest of the country either didn't want to hear yeah. or right. hadn't or hadn't heard. But you know, we. We can also, it's easy to, at the 50 year mark, to look back on things with kind of right. rose colored glasses. Hello. But, because, <laughs> uh, you know, when you're talking about straight out of Compton, um, it changed everything, yeah. but there was backlash, this huge was. backlash. This was. So I want you guys to talk about that for a little bit, you mm. know, because we're celebrating hip hop, but we also have to be, you know, mindful yes. that it's been a it's been a journey, it's been a fight, it's been you're still pushing against the same forces That's that right. wanted to ignore your stories to begin with. Yes, that I'm listening to when you were saying it, pushing, the word pushing in my head, that's what we did. That's what all those kids, that's what the artists did. They pushed. So in the beginning, to me, hip hop was a slow process, <laughs> getting to be something. First, we have to be acknowledged. And that's what was more concerning at that particular time when we were dancing. We just wanted to be heard. And this was one way that Don Kinnears created a vehicle that made people actually look at us on television. Mm -hmm. I mean, so therefore, 
we moved up a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then when the artists came on mm -hmm. and the artists, they really started to express how they liked what we were doing. Mm -hmm. So therefore, uh, hip hop, to me, it grew into a positive mm -hmm. yeah. to, uh, for everybody mm -hmm. because now everybody has that opportunity to strive and it's going to be hard all the way. It was always hard mm -hmm. because it took people who have visions that they could do it. And then there are people who have visions, no, they can't mm -hmm. and want to keep us down. Mm -hmm. But we kept striving and then, and we lived off the music of yeah. if all these artists they created they changed the music and to be a part of we actually help change the music mm -hmm. that puts that makes us feel that okay mm -hmm. we're doing something positive mm -hmm. and the music the rappers mm -hmm. i mean now when they came out of the jail you know being saying their whole thing nobody paid attention to them and so they now are something special too. Yeah. And that's what hip hop, the word hip hop, to me, I always thought, no, hip hop is like a bunny, nice thing. <laughs> 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 because, you know, street dance, they didn't really want to say street dance. It sounds hard. It sounds black. Let's find another word. And, and a group to me saying a hip hop, a hip, 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 hip. Don't yeah. stop the knock to the bang, bang, book a dip. So it was cute. Yeah. And so it's just like um, always striving to make, uh, instead of a, whatever color you are, your genre hmm. or your, the words that they put out has to be likable mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in order and to be acceptable. And so therefore the word hip hop to me is acceptable. Hmm. It's likable. Uh -huh. And so nobody doesn't like street dancers. Right. Does, that's this, hard. So, but this is a thing that I think the gift that West Coast hip hop mm -hmm. gave the world mm -hmm. is I, I completely agree with you and see what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And then we have groups coming out of the West Coast who are like, I don't care if you like me. That's right. Right? right? That's right. Yeah. Because yeah. it evolves. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Hip hop evolves. It gives us the right to say, I don't care. That's right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and that rebellious spirit um, leads me to, to say that it was initially a counterculture. Like, and this is important to note because even LL Cool J will tell you this back in the day, they, no one ever actually thought hip hop was going to go this, this far. far. Right. Like it wasn't expected to catch on. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the early adopters of hip hop were okay with that because mm -hmm. it wasn't mainstream. Mm -hmm. But as I think about the, the developments and the ways in which, uh, you know, uh, West Coast hip hop has made a name for itself, especially in the nineties, I'd be remiss to like not include how, um, how important women were into yes. this conversation. Yes. So JJ Fad and Supersonic, mm -hmm. um, Lady Rage, mm -hmm. Yo Yo. Yes, sir. Um, you know, when hip hop, w w whether it wants to give credit to Roxanne Shante, like, come mm -hmm. on, like, w whether hip hop wants to give credit to women, black women especially, exclusively, that it, it's 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 on the shoulders and backs of black women that who were the first dancers <laughs> of all the beats. <laughs> And and actually gave the men the validation that their songs actually could catch could on. Uh -huh. Right, it did. You Hello? also you also say that that uh, the on both coasts, by the black way. women um, were were making hip hop, making hip hop mm -hmm. art that you say was more inspiring thematically. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I'm a historian, so I I, I look at cycles. Yeah. So it's not surprising to me that much of <laughs> to the the chagrin of like um of, of male rappers today that black women rappers are dominating the genre currently mm -hmm. <laughs> because there was a period of time when queen latifah had a few people running for the hills oh, yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> and my man agrees with me she did. you know um it, it's so I, I look at the cycles yeah. and so yes. um, whether it's the meg the stallions and then the 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 the, the, the names of this era who um you know who are taking and um um, and 
using their agency to show that their lyrics are more than what they look on the paper. Like, mm -hmm. I, I love it. Yeah. I love it. And that's what I'll say. About okay. It. Yes. I want, I, I promise you, I'm seeing the questions come in and I want, and I'm going to get to them because they're, they're good, but I'm going to follow this thread uh, just a, a little bit longer because I think it's important because, I mean, sitting on the stage, we're in your shadow, Demita Joe, <laughs> is, you know, a black woman who is integral right. yes. to the development of hip hop. Can you just describe? A little bit about what that was like being a woman in uh also you know and even what was then as you said earlier pretty male dominated yes it was yeah. at that particular time when i was dancing yes men were on the floor dancing their heart off <laughs> and yet women are noted to always uh uh to make our husbands or our loved ones we are beside them we make them stand out but this was a time where for me, I wanted a woman like me and my mother <laughs> and my family because they were educators and they were teachers and they always believed and they instilled in me that you can be somebody. You, all you have to do is just stand up and be it. And so therefore, when I watched the guys and I watched the, the ladies, how they stood back and let the guys take the floor, then I just went, no, that's not right. Women should be in there. So every time I see these young kids, there are women, they're dancing, they're dressing, they're looking. I'm, I'm so proud because they, they're now taking the step forward mm. instead of just staying in the middle with their guy. And so for me, hip hop was a growing thing. Yeah. And uh, uh, because uh people of, of the kids you could see how they were shy <laughs> and the more you watch soul train they got to be a little stronger uh-huh you and then if you even look into the 1990s there are girls on the uh poles they are they hey yay look at my body pump 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 <laughs> <laughs> you know so i'm just saying that uh hip-hop to women, it's a growing thing. Mm -hmm. But now we're at a point, we have Queen Latifah. Yeah. We have all these young people who are taking the rims in rapping. Mm -hmm. So they're not just letting the guys do their little thing. Yeah. They are stepping up. Okay. Well, I wanna talk a, a little bit more uh, about women and also the, uh, let's say the, the the treatment of women in yes. hip-hop culture right because yes. we, we, i do think we have to talk about that a little yes. bit more and and the reason that uh that i think this popped to mind is rolling stone right now is putting out this series of top 100 mm -hmm. tracks in hip-hop for different styles of hip-hop mm -hmm. and it was really interesting the west coast one they all the editors almost apo they apologized because they're like they we know that a lot of tracks are going to be missing from this top 100 list and they were like well we could have just made you know one list that just featured nwa and tupac yes. and another tupac. so but anyway um what they put this is rolling stone now but what they put as number one uh was ain't nothing but a g thing okay hmm. and they said they according According to the, the Rolling Stone editors, they say it changed everything. This is, this is what they wrote. They said it made it um, the default style for Los Angeles, past and present. It brought street culture to the forefront permanently and forced every hip hop artist to decide whether they were gangsters or not. And it made Dr. Dre the undisputed king of West Coast, West Coast hip hop for generations to come. Okay, so then they say the song also uh, invokes some troubling responses. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, for if for folks who've seen the video, mm -hmm. there's some pretty difficult scenes uh, regarding male treatment of women. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll just leave it at that. Um, and also some of the, the actual lyrics mm -hmm. in the song. Mm -hmm. That wasn't the only one mm -hmm. in the 90s, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just it stands out because it was such a massive and important song. So that's also part of hip hop's mm -hmm. history and legacy. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how you, you think through that. Well, definitely for me as a woman, I don't like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like to be called the B word. 
a mm. lot. Maybe it's because of my background. Maybe I was around so many strong women. I just can't see another woman tell another woman that you're B and then use it in, in a, in a record or in a way to try to make it comfortable. But I don't like the B word. I don't like the F word. I don't like all these words because you can still insult somebody or love somebody with other words, <laughs> but they don't choose to do that because we're now to me at a time we've got to shock everybody and to right. be in this business, the, uh, the big people in this business would love to have you as an artist, but you got to come out of a jail. You got to be, you know, run over somebody. You got to do, you got to have more blood in the whole scene or whatever. So therefore the hip hop is my time when it was growing. Yeah. What it is today is altering is to me, it's changing. It's making young guys, you know, they're competing now with each other instead of spreading. They're beginning to, you know, oh, well, I sing better than you. And then you would say, no, I sing better than you. <laughs> and then I said so and so. And then this coming down to uh, your girlfriend. Well, she slept with me. No, mm -hmm. no, no, no. I slept with your mama. <laughs> and so they put that, they put all those different things in. So to me now, hip hop is, is changing. Yeah. yeah. <sighs> <laughs> well, misogyny is as American as, Amer as apple pie. We That's all true. know this. And so considering that hip hop is a reflection of American society. Mm -hmm. And given that misogyny is as American as apple pie, misogyny noir is as, is as important or significant in the black community. And during the 90s, you know, Ain't Nothing But A G Thing was the song. It was the song. And Too Short has a catchphrase of which is his favorite word is a B word. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and, um, and, 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 and as a historian, again, I, I look at the ebbs and flows of how misogyny has been interwoven within hip hop, mm -hmm. um, but also how it's how women, black women, particularly who are rappers, have uh, have undermined certain tropes right. of yeah. the Jezebel trope and all of these caricatures of black womanhood and then have reclaimed it on their own terms. And again, I, I love Queen Latifah, especially the golden age of hip hop, because who you calling up, right? You and I, T-Y. Yes. <laughs> you know, and, and, and one, we would be remiss to not look at that as a response to her contemporaries Correct. who were calling black women beats, mm -hmm. right? Um, but now um, the city girls are up, right? And they're calling each other the B word in an endearing way. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, I'm no one to tell women what to say to one another, yes, but I am responsible <laughs> to tell men what they shouldn't tell women that they should be called. And, right. and, and I think, um, as, as rappers, as, uh, communities become more educated about the impacts of words, especially to the LGBTQI community when right. it comes to hip hop right. and the ways in which, um, um, that's impact has, has lasting effects that education has to happen. And if, if we're being honest on this panel, mm -hmm. we're seeing four of the five elements of hip hop dominating the, the genre. But what we're missing is the knowledge. The knowledge. Mm -hmm. yeah. knowledge. Now, that's true. That's true. Knowledge is a key. Time has been flying, hasn't it? <laughs> I just looked up. I was like, oh my gosh, we only have 10 minutes. So I, I told these two we were going to need hours. <laughs> <laughs> um, just to get started, actually. So let me let me let me do uh, justice and honor to some of the audience questions here. Um, Tyree, this one's for you because you're talking about revolution, okay. right? Um, someone's asking, how does white flight uh, and the New York City financial crisis of the 1970s come into the American story? Because the question is, 
Is abandonment by capital and whiteness necessary for revolution? What? <laughs> it's the LAist audience, man. I'm telling you. You could tell. You could tell. Like Sheesh. That. Sheesh. I thought I'd throw you a softball. That was a softball. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So, um. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. These, these, these is right. <laughs> um, so, can you uh, repeat that? Re repeat, uh, paraphrase it, <laughs> just so I could like answer it forthrightly, because that was like a dissertation. Yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, I think the point of the uh, that the the questioner is asking is though. is revolution comes right. by for certain sure. reasons, sure, and sure, one sure. of them is just the uh, the abandonment of, of community. Of course, of yeah. course. Yeah, yeah. Um, so from a historical perspective, you, you have to look at New York, you can look at LA. I actually, for the sake of this conversation, we're gonna focus on LA. Yep. Um, the ways in which freeways have cut LA into certain quadrants, yeah. mm -hmm. particularly like the Sugar Hill area, mm -hmm. um, the West Adams district, for those who don't know it, Sugar Hill, yep. um, is, is a freeway that has cut a black neighborhood in half. Yes. But there's also been freeways that have been built to make sure that the black community doesn't leave South Central Correct. and come above the 10, hello, right. Right. not an accident, right? And you think about the, sub so the suburban elements of LA and you think about why Crenshaw or Compton, Compton especially used to be an all white town mm -hmm. and where are all the white people now? Yes. Mm -hmm. And why is Compton seen as the most dangerous area in, in one of the most dangerous areas of the city? White flight. Mm -hmm. And ironically, dive. When white flight occurs, so does divestment happen as exactly. well. And when divestment happens, so does hyper-policing. And with hyper-policing comes um, all of the effects of that um, uh, police brutality and, mm -hmm. and, and the like. That divestment creates the music, the journalistic elements that we've been listening to for the last 20, 30 years. But to be honest, as a child of the hip hop generation, the hip hop generation will tell you, we don't need you to divest from our communities to hear our voices. That's right. And if you need to divest from our communities to get the real from us, then there probably needs to be another mirror you need to look at. <laughs> but America's issue, Los Angeles's issue, Harlem's issue is now pressing because gentrification is happening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what mm -hmm. happens when you have the children of those who, whose parents fled through whiteness out of inner cities. And now their children are the new adopters of the genre. That's yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they love black culture as much as black people love black culture. Mm -hmm. Now there has to be a new conversation about homage and appropriation. But hopefully if investment occurs while that conversation is happening, then we can get back to the knowledge base that started the genre to begin with. Yeah, the talk mm -hmm. is not enough. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. That's true. Yes. Still is not. I actually, knowledge. I want to meet that person who asked that question later, wherever you are. That was fine. By the way, that was an extemporaneous like I didn't, dissertation. I was freestyling wasn't it? right now. That was really cool. <laughs> I owe okay. you a Starbucks gift card or something. So here's another question from the audience, and and Demetri, I think it was. Uh, well, I mean, I'm going to give this one to you because you've uh -oh. spoken about hip hop uh, and its era of of growth and putting s stories and. <laughs> showcasing the capabilities of the black community to a broader world. Mm -hmm. uh, someone wants to know if you think that the love of hip hop may have been a contributing factor to what they see as um, maybe the greater, the greater racial harmony that this generation experiences. Definitely. I always think that because number one, um, dancing the way I was dancing and watching the way I was watching how it was actually growing and you seeing it and therefore loving every bit of it because it's giving us a strength of knowledge of learning to know what's behind the screen number two somebody's <laughs> finally asking that and we're doing that through hip-hop hip-hop is making us because in the beginning like i said um we're down. Uh, uh, we're young kids, and we're not told that we can be great kids. Mm -hmm. We're just told that we are kids, and and therefore you have to accommodate whatever the world is giving us. 
now by being hip hop to me always gave more strength. Mm -hmm. And so therefore I believe that the, 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 the hip hop to everybody of my age, especially, <laughs> and I was, I'm only 36. <laughs> <laughs> You but don't even look as old as that. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> I'll take that. <laughs> but anyway, the the hip hop era to me, period, is the growth. And today, in my opinion, it is changing. Uh -huh. And I don't know why it's changing because of so many craziness is happening in the world today. Okay. But I was just seeing that the kids are pushing through they're mm -hmm. still creating they're still coming up without they even they make them go back oh how did so and so do that or make you know um, uh, the moonwalk okay the moonwalk wasn't uh, uh really created by michael jackson like michael said that he loved the street dancing and he loved the characters and the kids and all of us doing it he started to do that because he had a popularity that people would look at him mm -hmm. to in order to do that mm -hmm. so but i'm saying we could go back to marcel marceau the mime people huh. who started to do all the mime mm -hmm. and the okay the the uh have an umbrella mm -hmm. and the the wind is coming mm -hmm. they slide back mm -hmm. go back to the tap dancers the black yes. dancers yes. they were doing moonwalking as they called it uh uh, uh, uh michael people called it the moonwalk it's a great name because everybody loved it it's <laughs> catchy so that's what we are in now we're in also a catchy world yeah. but i'm just saying that hip-hop that's what i love okay you know i, I apologize to everyone we're, we are going to go over a couple of minutes here because there's a, there are lots of great questions from the audience. I'm only going to get to. Is that okay with y'all? A few more minutes. Okay. Call a response. Yeah. Call a response. I I don't want to go over too much because there's art happening outside. No, that's and, true. and you have to. We have to um, uh, acknowledge and and appreciate that. We have graffiti artists outside. There's a DJ who's who's Yay! out there. It's going to be amazing. DJ artistic in the building. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but a few more minutes. This one's for you, Tyree, because we were, we were talking about uh, female hip hop artists. So this person wants to know, speak to the differences between female MCs like MC Light and Money Love versus Cardi B and Nicki Minaj. What happened to the consciousness spoken by the OG female MCs? Am I the one to ask this question? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I love that. That's a great question. No. <laughs> Oh, uh, what happened? That's a that's a great question. I, again, I'm just a historian, so I study the record. And um, I, I, I to be honest, I've had some very interesting reviews of like how hip hop music has changed. And I think Soul Train is a, my favorite example because you can actually see how <laughs> how Black America was changing. And like, and Don Cornelius is mentioned to say that he had like. He wasn't a fan of hip hop first. That's right. And because he was like, all that gyrating, all that, like, what's going on? <laughs> I promise I'll get to the point of about Cardi B. I, the agency of women in hip hop is a fascinating dissertation for anyone who wants to write it. I, I think that where the golden age of hip hop, where knowledge was prefaced mm -hmm. and it was cool to be sm um, smarter than your other peers, particularly about topics and knowledge bases that they may not have access to, um, and then use rhyme to, to like distribute it. I think now the Cardi B's of the world and the Meg Thee Stallions and, um, um, are actually in intentional conversations with the OGs in, in a lot better ways than the male counterparts are with the, with the male, um, with their younger OGs or the, yeah. the like, follow what I'm saying. And, and, I actually see the OG women applauding the Cardi B's more than I see the OG men up, uh, applauding the 21 Savages. Uh -huh. And how black women today, the Cardi B's, are using their sexuality as a, as a form of empowerment. I mean, MC Light will tell you that she felt as empowered as Cardi B does today when she was um, battling the men on the black or in or in music videos. I don't, I think the expression of sexuality and the policing of black women's sexuality yes. is the real conversation. Yeah. 
and I'm not the, the one who's going to adjudicate that discussion. <laughs> but I will say that the impact is felt and it, the reach that Cardi B's, the Meg Thee Stallions, the Nicki Minaj's have today mm -hmm. is what the MC Lights and the Queen Latifah's dreamed that their music could one day tap into. Right. And I think there's an arc that both sides of that spectrum could appreciate. Okay. So <laughs> Y'all not going to get me in trouble. Right. <laughs> I have to give a hand for that. Yeah. That, was that was hard. <laughs> so, um, I, oh gosh, I wish I had like another hour. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, Really? No. <laughs> so there's there's two two more things that I just want to touch on. Sure. Um, and then, like I said, you guys are going to be around a little bit afterwards. Yeah. And yeah. please, these they are <laughs> profound fonts of of knowledge and experience. Um, God, I was so excited to do this, and you and it's even better <laughs> than I hoped. <laughs> um, I keep I keep thinking of what you started with, Tyree, about revolution. Revolution. Yeah. But fifty years later. The revolutionaries are in the establishment, Ooh. right? Ooh. Okay, because they, they are in fact leading what be, because and I, this is my thesis uh, that yes, hip hop still remains mm -hmm. one of the most important American stories. Mm -hmm. uh, it is one of the most Amer important American art forms that has global reach. Right. Okay, yeah. um, but at the same time, part of that global reach means that many of the you know the the hip hop artists that we all know are part of the establishment because they are the music business, right? Um, I think Kendrick Lamar's winning of the Pulitzer is a moment where the establishment recognized mm -hmm. the critical importance mm -hmm. of hip hop mm -hmm. as, a, as a high form of American expression. But we also have, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but like Dr. Dre has a, yeah. At USC, yeah, he's yeah, got yeah. he's he, the, the, the the young Ivine the Ivine Young Academy. Mm -hmm. If yeah. I got it right, okay, yeah, cool. But this is what we want, right? We want the stamp right. of success. Hmm. On the other hand, though, there's always the risk of a revolution losing its edge when it becomes part of the establishment. Yeah. yeah. Do you want? Do you worry about that? One hundred percent. Do you, I mean? Demita, can I, I, I ask really, you about I really, that? I really think it's a, it has a lot to do with uh, wanting this showbiz world. Mm -hmm. And the showbiz world is they are wanting now to me today, they want to really sell you. And they will do negative stuff on you or positive stuff, something that will sell. Therefore, it's, it's coming down to the money. Mm -hmm. So the, it's not the, um, your attitude, your, I mean, now you're almost getting invisible because the people in producing executives, all of those people in the show business, I got, I can make you a star or I could break you. So therefore, that's what's turning that's what's what i'm seeing today is changing because i've been in the business for a long 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 time and worked with so many different people just to see the carney and the way she's talking and i i understand be i applaud her because there are kid people who were uh, uh strippers or not but now you're seeing them because she is making you see them. Right. Yeah, she's making them visible. Right? Yes. Yeah. And but there is still they want the ballroom brawl mm. to 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 make her feel that oh, she can sell tickets or mm -hmm. whatever if she does things like that. Yeah. yeah. But you know, it, I, there's a there's a conflict here mm -hmm. because yes, m moving into the establishment mm -hmm money mm -hmm. they can they can take the fire out of a revolution mm -hmm. but at the same time again black americans have been so cut off yeah. from right. a, that a, you know, wealth yeah. building when, when, so right. it's like the success should not be uh, penalized you know what i mean of course mm -hmm. of course of course like we we want that success so yeah. I, i'm not quite sure how to how to, how to think through it well, well so when you look at hip-hop as a response to 
when you look at the birth of hip hop as a response to Reagan nomics yeah. mm-hmm. and the war on drugs, you actually look at how the war on drugs sought to defang, defang the black power movement. Mm-hmm. So when, oh, thank you, dear brother, thank you, you feel me? <laughs> Um, so, so actually, hip hop was supposed to be a counter response to Reagan's administration policies. Mm-hmm. But the problem was is that the moment you give or dangle, because this is the real key, mm-hmm. if you dangle a carrot in front of Im- impoverished people, That's right. and you try to force them to let go of their arms, whether it's a microphone or arms. And you tell them that if you follow the breadcrumbs, I will give you and your family access out of the projects. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. But you can forget about your homies on the block. That's right. Then you go back to the block, you flex on the block by wearing all the chains, and then it creates a level of jealousy. Mm-hmm. This contributes to the inner city turmoil that actually restarts the same consequences yes. of the war on drugs. Mm-hmm. And if we are look at it from a political lens that hip hop has been defamed from its political mm-hmm. aspects of knowledge, mm-hmm. albeit that saddens me, I still have a confidence in black people to free and liberate themselves. And whether it's hip hop, or whether it's jazz, Mm -hmm. whether it's gospel music, whether it's spirituals, we will continue to innovate a new technology that will help us Mm -hmm. get out of dire straits. Sadly, hip hop's corporatization undermines those strengths. Yes. But I do fundamentally believe that there's something on the horizon that will assist in this upliftment. Oh, Mm -hmm. okay. So I (laughs) like... No, that that's an informed optimism. <laughs> I read a I lot of it. books. No, because I, you know, I, I was thinking about uh, another way of looking at perhaps the next fifty years of yeah. hip hop, uh, and again, being at that transition point as a cultural force, going you know from the neighborhoods to around the world. Mm-hmm. But then also we have a technological inflection point going exactly. on right now, exactly. where. Basically anybody, anyone, mm-hmm. anybody with a computer and an idea right. can put out, you know, whether it's new, new dance, new, dance. new music, <laughs> whatnot. And we, but we have some perverse incentives going on uh-huh. too, right? Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. folks just putting out like little ideas over TikTok <laughs> just to see what'll, what'll yes. catch. Right. <laughs> um, I, I wonder if, but what both of you think mm. in the, you know, in the various five pillars of hip hop, mm that technology might do because so much of this conversation, so much of the truth of the first 50 years of hip hop was, is, is dependent on the, on the lives and the stories of the people creating the art. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But if we have virality driving where hip hop might go next, yeah. do you wor- worry that it flattens the depth of it? Do, do you wanna go first? No. Oh, you sure? Not Why not? Okay. No, no. <laughs> No, <laughs> no. Uh, you go first. You sure? You sure? Yeah, yeah. Go. Okay. So I, I, in, um, I was having a conversation with my uncle, Quasi Boyd Bolden. He is the one who introduced me to hip hop. He helped me fall in love with the genre. And while we were prepping, I was talking to him as with excitement to talk to y'all. I was asking him, I was like, Unc, like, like, where, where is fifty? Where is hip hop going to be in the next fifty years? Yeah. And he was saying that social media is actually undermining the, the strength yeah. of that development of the new technology that will help liberation, uplift black people, la la la. And he was telling me that social media is distracting. Mm-hmm. from innovation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hence the reason why billionaires are thinking they're innovators. Mm-hmm. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> because That's they right. think they're the new creatives. Yes. <laughs> when we all know that all innovation and creativity usually starts from the bottom, bottom up, up. <laughs> and rarely does it ever come from the top um, down. down. So when, I, when, I'm, when I'm thinking about hip hop again, Sadly, the artists are distracted with numbers and likes, Mm -hmm. which distracts them from the knowledge that they need to politically 
um, arm themselves mm -hmm. to speak truth to power, which was hip hop's initial intention, mm -hmm. then would allow mobilization and organization of inner city communities to fundamentally change the social landscapes in which they inhabit. Yeah. With, with that distraction and the virality element of TikTok, Instagram, la la la, we almost have to ask ourselves, do we need this technology to, to really get our word out? Is it for, if it, is it for, is it, is it self aggrandizing? I don't think, I think t social media in particular is delaying that gratification yeah. from successful organization politically. And if, or it's not even a goal anymore. It's yeah. not for even, some. it's not yeah. even useful mm -mm. to the people who need it the most. Oh, right. okay. For their liber, for their liberation. Yeah. I think it's useful individually. Right. Yeah. I, I, of course, I mean, I can, we can go, we could start a group right now. <laughs> we could be the new De La Soul up here, you know? And, and we would go viral if everyone pulled out their phones at the same time, right? But, but what would that do to improve black and brown people's lives? Right. That's right. That's right. I mean, we're black and brown people, so, you know, we, we can get it popping, but we would be enfranchised, but what about our community? Exactly. That's right. Yeah. Right. Demita, do you want to add to that? I just wanted to add that, see, I'm not a computerized person. <laughs> <laughs> Technology is wonderful, it's here, that's fine. But, I, you know, I can live without it. But it, to me, the, uh, the, uh, the technology is taking away the artistry of people. I mean, the, they don't create anymore. You can look on, t on the technology, you know, they'll say, make a left at, at so-and-so block, you know. <laughs> did, did I ask you what, to, <laughs> to tell me to go left? I'm, let me use my mind. I know I'm going to turn left. Don't tell me. Yeah. But I'm just saying that technology to me has grown so big in my head. I, I just can't deal with all of it. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm always asking a girlfriend of mine, I said, anybody know any computer stuff? Call me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, to, to me, um, an algorithmically driven development of an art form divorces the art form from the humanity, yes. which makes it impactful, right? right? right. So, um, I'm gonna wrap up with one, I'm gonna ask Demita to tell us one more story. Uh, and, and, then, and then we'll wrap up to absorb and honor the art that's going on outside. But first of all, I, I wanna say that uh, Demita Joe has a book out. Hello. You should get it. Yes. You should have plugged Everybody it. Get, I'm gonna, it's called, it's, there you go. There, there you go, it. yep. It's called, Are You the Girl from Soul Train? Can you believe that? This is my book. <laughs> Hello. Finally. Because people ask you that question a lot, I, I gather. Are you the girl from Soul Train? Are you You're the like, girl yes. From Soul Train. I get that even if, uh, if I wanted to call for gas. You know, the gas yeah. company, the lady be saying, uh, Demita, Jill, are you that girl on Soul Train? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I could go to Home Depot and one guy would look at it. And then my mother be saying, that man is looking at you. <laughs> and I'm going like, and then he comes up and he says, uh, I just want to know, are you the girl on Soul Train? <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I called it. So are you the girl on Soul Train? And uh, it's, I, I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but I'm going to read it cover to cover because I'm sure it's full of juicy, the one, most amazing stories. Things. Now, I, I want to close with a story from you because... <sighs> I am, we are sitting on the stage with a true legend. <laughs> and Demita Joe's impact um, spreads far beyond yes. uh, the things that you might have known of seeing her do, right, yes. on, on Soul Train. And I love this story. You just told it to us <laughs> backstage. I hope you don't mind. Okay. Because again, you're iconic in so many ways. <laughs> and this is one of the ways I did not know See? that you are iconic, okay? okay? And it has to do with the movie Airplane. Airplane. Right. It was a movie called Airplane <laughs> that everybody liked by David uh, Zucker and Jerry uh, Zucker. And I had the opportunity to come in and talk to them. And they wanted me to choreograph where it's a John Travolta uh, thing in, in, in the movie. And so anyway, 
I don't know why, but I just came in talking jab or talking to them, you know, using uh, crazy words. And one brother would look at me and go like, what did she say? <laughs> and so the other brother looked at uh, uh, Jerry and they said, why don't we put that in the, sh in the movie? <laughs> you know <laughs> and the I, scene. I, and, I, and, I, and she said, and they started creating in front of me, talking about, okay. No, uh, you were creating for them. Well, I've already given them the idea. <laughs> but anyway, she the uh, one star saying, yeah, we can have the stewardess in a way ask, you know, tea, coffee, or milk. And then she, uh, the, she will be talking in a way, but we get a white lady, like a leave it to beaver lady <laughs> or whatever like that. And we can uh, have her interpret <laughs> what she just said to her. And I went, oh, that's a good. And then uh, 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 Jerry Zucker looked and said that, uh, oh, you should play that part. <laughs> That would be great. And here I am so excited. <laughs> I've never been in the movie. Oh my God, this is the first time. And, and then I got a call uh, at, at Paramount. And so I thought something really happened to my mother or something because I told her I was gonna come. And the lady uh, secretary came in and said, uh, uh, Ms. Freeman, uh, we have a call for you real quick. And they said, it's emergency. And I was going like, this was kind of weird. And, you know, I'm talking to them and I said, hold that thought. I'll be right back. And I went and I answered on the phone and that was Cher. <laughs> I was working, uh, was working at that time with Cher, but then I was, uh, I was free for a while, but one of the guys hurt his leg. So she said, get on the plane. Uh, to, uh, so I, we will meet you at the uh, airport in Las Vegas. And so, and I went, uh, 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 <laughs> I didn't know what to really say. So I finally had to go you were back. supposed to be in a movie. There you were supposed you go, to be in an airplane. In my first movie. <laughs> <laughs> and so I had to explain to them that uh, I won't be able to do, uh, what was I here for? Oh, for the John Travolta thing. And then and he, and he said, yeah, next thing I know on an airplane, I saw this little scene that I'm doing. And I'm watching how people have really started, oh, they love that scene the, with the lady. And, uh, and, and it was a black guy playing that part. And I was just going like, oh my God. So I'm excited. <laughs> she is the creator of that scene. <laughs> I made a mark. <laughs> Miss Freeman told us that back there, and I my jaw dropped. I was like, <laughs> that is the iconic scene from that movie. <laughs> you were the creator of that. Oh my God. So I just I wanted to point that out because it's not directly related no. to the 50th right. anniversary of hip hop, but you know, true greatness spreads in all different <laughs> ways. And I wanted to recognize I wanted to recognize that. Um, <laughs> Demita Joe Freeman and Tyree Boyd Pates, this could not have been a better conversation. I'm privileged to be up here with you. you well. Thank We're you privileged. so much. <laughs> thank We're you so much. Let's give them a round of applause. And thank you all for coming. Thank you to the LAist. There's art going on outside. Check it out. Oh, everybody and get book. my book at Amazon. <laughs> Just look up a uh, look up under Amazon a book, and then you get my book. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>